This last video refers to the two articles, Albert Carr's Is Business Bluffing Ethical? and Norman Gillespie's The Business of Ethics, both of which are in your course pack. These are readings that exemplify the notion that there's a truly separate set of norms that belongs to business professionals in abstraction from ordinary societal expectations. These articles help us to understand the notion of the normative leeway that is given by society to business professionals, enabling them to carry out their critical functions. Albert Carr starts off in his article by saying that most executives from time to time are almost compelled in the interests of their companies or themselves to practice some form of deception when negotiating with customers, dealers, labor unions, government officials, or even other departments of their own companies. By conscious misstatements, concealment of pertinent facts, or exaggeration, in short, by bluffing, they seek to persuade others to agree with them. And he goes on to ask, are they ethically justified in doing so? In responding to this question, Carr argues that business is like the game of poker, and thus, just as in poker, behavior that is deemed to be unethical in everyday life is justified in business. He uses this analogy to argue that there's a separate set of norms that belongs to the business professions. Deception, bluffing, dishonesty, lying, greed, and espionage, which are in general frowned upon in ordinary society, are part of the poker game that is business. In this sense, there is a degree of normative leeway that pertains to business persons in the performance of their critical functions that deviates from ordinary societal norms. Not only that, he argues, but just like in poker, it is right and proper to bluff a friend out of the rewards of being dealt a good hand. Lying for Carr is part of the accepted rules of the business game and no moral culpability attaches to it. According to Carr, we ought to do it. We can't win if we don't. Carr says no one expects poker to be played on the ethical principles preached in churches. Instead, he claims that poker has its own special ethics. But he also admits that he is not attempting to diminish rules against cheating or to legitimize outright cheating. So he is not arguing that simply anything goes, but he is saying that there is a separate set of norms that belongs to business. He says, Poker's own brand of ethics is different from the ethical ideals of civilized human relationships. The game calls for distrust of the other. He continues on to say that, Cunning deception and concealment of one's strengths and intentions, not kindness and open-heartedness, are vital in poker. No one thinks any worse of poker on that account, and no one should think any worse of the game of business because its standards of right and wrong differ from the prevailing traditions of morality in our society. So for Carr, it is true that special exemptions from ordinary ethical norms accrue to business professionals, and that deviating from these ordinary ethical norms is perfectly acceptable. While we can positively admit to Carr's premise that there's a truly separate set of norms that belong to business professionals, in abstraction from the ordinary norms of society, Gillespie disagrees with Carr and raises several issues and problems in Carr's article. From the critical perspective of, of Gillespie, we might argue that Carr's analogy commits the fallacy from logic of a weak analogy. Is one thing business truly like another, poker? This is what Gillespie is alluding to in his statements that business is not a game. People's lives, their well-being, their plans, and their futures often depend upon business and the way that it is conducted. People have the right not to be misled or deceived about the true nature of the goods or services that they buy. Gillespie concludes that the poker analogy, while informative of the way things are, seems to have no bearing at all on the way things ought to be in business. From this last statement by, by Gillespie, we might argue that Carr commits what is called the is-ought fallacy, which just means the conflation of a statement about what is with a statement about what ought to be. Carr seems to be saying that on the basis of the fact that the business world is filled with persons lying, deceiving, and committing acts of dishonesty, we ought to commit acts of lying, deception, and dishonesty. For purposes of comparison, another example of the is-ought fallacy comes to us from evolutionary biology, where some people claim that on the basis of that evolution by, Dar evolution by Darwinian natural selection is the truth of biological reality, and it involves organisms committing acts of biotic violence against one another, we are fully legitimated to engage in acts of violence against one another ourselves. 
A further example for comparison of the is ought fallacy is an argument made by ben Benjamin Fla Franklin that he made to himself against his own vegetarianism. Benjamin Franklin relates that for a time he was a vegetarian, but his abstinence from animal flesh came to an end when he was watching some friends prepare to fry a fish they had just caught. He was hungry and he couldn't resist the smell. When the fish was cut open, it was found to have a smaller fish in its stomach. Well, Franklin said to the fish, if you animals, you fish, eat one another, I don't see why we may not eat you. And he proceeded to do so. Admittedly, the is ought fallacy is not always a logical fallacy, in that, for example, on the basis of our objective knowledge of what is, we know what we ought not to do to another person. For example, we generally know what contributes to human flourishing, things like having nutritious food, clean fresh water, education, access to health care, etc. All these contribute to human well-being. On this basis, we know what we ought not to do, ethically speaking, to another person. For example, remove these things from the other person. However, for his claims to be fully warranted, Carr would need to show how his conflation of the is and the ought avoids the more logically problematic expression. So while we would do well to agree with Carr that there's a truly separate set of norms pertaining to business professions, professionals in comparison with the ordinary, ordinary norms of society, we might not agree that the separate set of norms necessarily entails the need to carry out non-virtuous acts of dishonesty, deception, lying, greed, and espionage as an ought. For Gillespie, the fact that there's a separate set of norms pertaining to business professionals requiring them to be competitively, competitively strategic in their dealings does not entail that the practices that they embrace must be a complete reversal from ordinary norms. As Gillespie states, it is, it is not the case that one necessarily has to choose between the well-being of one's family and being honest about one's political preferences. Lastly, Carr's article can be said to commit the appeal to popularity fallacy. In logic, this is the peer pressure fallacy. Everyone else is doing it, so you should too. That we must be deceitful, dishonest, greedy, because everybody else is doing it. After all, you'd be putting yourself at a competitive disadvantage by not doing the same. Is this necessarily true? As Gillespie says, just because everybody else is committing murder does not make it right for you to do so. Although here we must interject that Carr is not talking about murder, and Gillespie's statement needs rewording. I'll, I'll leave it up to you to determine who is right here. Maybe a position somewhere in between the two will be best. These articles and issues about normative leeway are also a lead into our next topic on stockholder versus stakeholder management. The class of Monday, September 16th, I'll be back in class and our course schedule re will return to normal. Please bring any questions you might have about what's being discussed in these makeup video lectures to class and we'll try to deal with them there. Then we'll talk about the purpose of the corporation. So for the next class, uh, Monday, September 16th, please read the preamble to the topic entitled Corporate Responsibility Stockholder, Stockholder versus Stakeholder Management in the textbook from pages 46 to 51, as well as the two articles, Milton Freeman's The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Its Profits, which is on page 53 to 57, as well as Edward Freeman's Managing for Stakeholders from pages 57 to 68, also in the textbook. I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.